Vampirage is a really big and rich theory. And we're talking about Vampirage, we're talking about Philippe Vampirage in two discontinuous times. Uh, we're talking about him right now because we're building off of what we talked about with Rawls and Nozick last week. And he references them and other uh, political theory in this chapter five. And he recommended, he recommended that. Um, and so I figured we'd talk about it now, but then he's going to be appearing in class in a few weeks. And when it comes time to have class, you all need to be ready with lots of questions for him, discussions and issues and stuff like that. So, uh, so I figured it'd be good to split him up and he'll be really ready. This will give you a chance to maybe have a second round of reading on Van Price, because it's a big and full and rich theory that he's been writing on since the 1980s. And there's a lot of Van Parijs on the syllabus. I recommend that you look at it pretty broadly. And I also recommend uh, talking to each other, reading different parts. So you can share different parts. So when we get to like what Van Parijs, when Van Parijs uh, is going to appear, uh, I think like some of you should read this part. I mean, we should maybe talk about it in advance. Who wants to read this? Who wants to read that? Who wants to read the other thing? So that we get... Uh, so that we get uh, different perspectives on him. You can compare your perspectives. So now I'm trying to sum up Van Parijs with which what he says, written a couple of years ago, uh, co-authored with Yannick van der Voort. But it's really a summation of his theory from the last 30, 40 years. And he thinks that this is his best summary of his theory. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm not sure that it's the best short statement of his theory that he's written in his life, um, but this is what he recommended that we focus on. So, so uh, let's focus on this. So this is in a book about basic income. So it's not a book about his theory. It's a book very different than the one I just presented about myself. It starts with, and so it's, it's already, it's the ethics chapter that comes after four chapters of other issues about basic income. Uh, and so it starts out actually not make, by making an ethical case for basic income, but by making responses to one of the most common objections to basic income, the reciprocity objection or the exploitation objection, the free riding objection, uh, that UBI recipients live off the labor of other people, which is which is prima facie uh, something that people should do. Uh, now, he responds to this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be using he, uh, even though this is co-author with Yannick van der Voort, who's very good on his own, this is Van Parijs' theory. I mean, if you know Van Parijs' theory, you read this paper, this is, this is Van Parijs' theory, Yannick might've helped to write this, but it's his theory. So, uh, so I'm going to be using he rather than they. Um, he uh, he responds to this by saying, "Well, it seems like a type like a type one error would be um, we we don't want to apply this reciprocity principle to the disabled people who can't work shouldn't be expected to work, um, and we and we need to help them and and." It's not, uh, and there's, there's an error that you make when we're trying to separate disabled. Very often we screw it up. We think this person can work when in fact they can't work. And so, we, uh, and so we're not helping them. So even in the face of this, a basic income could help the disabled. People who want to work but are unable to because of whatever mental or physical disability that they have. Then there's also a sort of a type two error which it helps what he believes are the biggest victim of reciprocity violations right now, and that is caregivers. We need people to raise children or we're all gonna starve in our old age. Everybody needs somebody to raise children. It takes, and not to mention uh, care for elderly or sick adults. We need people to do these things, especially the children, because if we don't have them, we're all going to starve. Uh, and yet, the people who do these things do not get paid and also get disrespected and are actually punished in their, they're punished in their effort to move up in careers. 
you have people who who work for 10 years, take five years out, just five years to, to raise very young kids, go back in the labor force. They lose the position they were at five years ago, and you find 50 years at the end of the career, they're tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars behind people who didn't do that. The whole world is free riding off the effort of caregivers. So basic income will help with both of these problems. Um, and he argues that only a, a really insignificant minority of people are going to be the truly lazy UBI recipients throughout their lives, if anybody. Uh, I mean, most people are going to want to work. And some people, if they take some time off here and there um, for just because they want time off, is that so bad for everybody to do it once in a while in their lives? And a lot of people, when they are taking that time off, it is, it is for what we think of good reasons. Like they're, they actually lost their job or they're looking for a better job or retraining or something like that. Um, now, and then, but then he talks about another violation of reciprocity. That if we have a truly reciprocal system, uh, you would expect a truly reciprocal system, you would expect everybody to work just as hard for just the same job. You know, if every, for, for, just, for everybody to work just as hard for the same reward. Uh, but what we have, and we, we have a system, and we know we have the system where the highest paid jobs have the best working conditions and, the, and, the, and, are, the, and, and are the most pleasant jobs to do. The lowest paid jobs have the most stress, the worst working conditions, and the least pay. And we do not have a perfect meritocracy of all that. And when you find, like the COVID was a great example of this, we find that when we got a, when we were looking for who's an essential worker, we found it largely those are the people at the bottom, the most essential workers, the people the worst jobs. And so what we have is an, exploita an exploitation, exploitation thing where the people with the, the good, well-paid, pleasant, life-fulfilling jobs are living off the people who are doing, living off the efforts of the people who are doing the harder, uh, the harder, more difficult, uh, less paid, poor, uh, higher stress, uh, uh, longer hours jobs. So that's a form of reciprocity violation, and UBI can help with that by giving market power to the people with those jobs and creating greater equality through the system. So then he defines, he really then defines the essence of his real libertarianism, uh, which is called real freedom for all. Now, real libertarianism uh, is his own term, and it's based on a, a term that he defines technically. The term, the term real freedom. For Van Parijs is a technical term, and you got to understand the definition of that technical term. Uh, it is the freedom to do whatever one might want to do. Um, essentially, I find this, I find this to be pretty much synonymous with freedom as opportunity. More opportunities, you're more free, less opportunities, you're less free. Uh, that's something we can ask Philippe when he comes up. Uh, is is freedom to do whatever one might want to do pretty much the same as, a free, as, as freedom as opportunity. Uh, he rejects the idea of calling it positive freedom because he rejects the distinction between positive and negative freedom. But he does do some negative freedom characterizing this. And the thing is, this kind of free, real freedom as technically defined has a distributive character. If, there, if, if we made all the opportunities equal because of incentives in the world, we would all have lower opportunities. If we, if we allow for some people to have greater opportunities, that might be a necessary consequence of having a society that gives people incentives to do the things that we need. So, um, so it has this distributive character, and so equalizing it might actually make even the least advantage worse off. So here he really takes off from Rawls. Rawls wants to lex him in, uh, wants to lex him in 
wages and, and, and net advantages and primary goods. Leximin, if you remember from Rawls, Leximin is minimizing the, uh, it's a lexicographical prioritization of minimizing the maximum loss. That's Leximin. The maximum loss being ending up as the least advantaged person in society. Rawls wants to, wants to Leximin, wants to Leximin either income or primary goods, whereas, whereas Van Parijs wants to Leximin freedom. So you want to maximize, so instead of equalizing this technical term, real freedom, you want to have uh, maximize the freedom of the least free person. Uh, so what, what Rawls does with wages, he does with freedom as opportunity. And this leads him then to unconditional basic income. You have the highest sustainable unconditional basic income. He argues that people have the freedom to do whatever they might want to do, but the least free person has as much of that as we know how to get. Um, but he does not go for the purely positive freedom route by saying we're going to do this regardless of anything else. It's just we're only we he said he he, he agrees to the exploitation objection to UBI to this extent. And that is that we should be sensitive to people's ambition. Okay, if, if say uh, Medha and Andrea, or do you go by Andy? Uh, no. Andrea, okay, Medi, Medha and Andrea, let's say they've had exactly equal opportunities. And Medha is just, and just enjoy laying about, which you're allowed to in the vampire system, enjoy laying about, that's all she's ever wanted to do. Whereas Andrea has taken advantage of these opportunities and has earned a bunch of stuff and she's, uh, uh, and she's worked really hard in order to get to do trips and stuff like that. Well, Medha would have more opportunity if we took from, uh, from some of what Andrea has got from her very great ambition, and we gave some of those opportunities to Meta. It's like, well, but she, but remember, we said we started, they were equal in every conceivable way. Um, she could have done it the way, um, uh, if Meta, if, if, if Andrea worked for those opportunities and Meta didn't, um, then we're actually lowering the opportunities that Meta has, that really kind of the both of them have to, work for and gain these things. So he, do, he does want to be sensitive to your ambition. So he's not going to leximize, leximize the opportunities that come from everything. He wants to, wants to leximize the opportunities that come from external gifts, the things that are beyond our control. Because we, we really don't have a situation where we have two people with the exact same opportunities. Um, how do we do that? Well, um, we do that by looking at the value contributed by natural resources. This is well, you know, um, natural resources are the gift of nature. Nobody has a natural right to own these more than anything other. Any income you're getting from natural resources should be taxed and redistributed at the highest sustainable level. This is a proposal that goes back, in some sense, all the way to Thomas Paine, who is the the godfather of the basic income movement. Um, also to Henry George, although Henry George did not talk about redistributing it in cash. Uh, uh, but this idea of, of taxing the value of natural resources, high, highest level, that is one thing. Um, then he looks at the value contributed by past technologies. Um, those don't belong to anybody in particular either. So those we can we can do that, but also entrepreneurial rents. It is you know one thing if uh, if Andrea and Meta both start businesses and uh, yours just happens to get uh, Andrea's just happens to get a, a a wonderful niche and makes millions of dollars in profits and yours kind of stagnates. Those kind of entrepreneurial profits that are over and above what you work for and really the country just you're getting lucky in the market. Those he said we could tax and redistribute. And what he calls job rents, which are when I talked about before how we have uh, the worst jobs 
They have the lowest pay, the most stress, and so forth, and the highest jobs tend to be the more pleasant jobs. That those happen because there's some sort of disequilibrium, in the, well, there's some sort of market failure going on. And so the job rents could also be taxed. So he goes from he goes from starting out with what really libertarian what what left libertarians would want, which is taxation only on resources, and but looking at resources and rents, and you're looking at all the different kinds of rents in society, and comes with that's so many rents that we can just go to an income tax. Uh, as an approximation for what is going to get those four different kinds of rents. And then he addresses Rawls. Um, now, he's built on Rawls. He's very much a Rawlsian who takes out this Malibu surfer idea. If you remember from Rawls, Rawls um, was a liberal egalitarian who deviated from strict egalitarianism because of individual responsibility, and efficiency, and uh, Van Price was with him on that. Um, and he wanted to maximize the advantage of the least advantaged person. And NIT, well, he used this example of NIT, but Musgrave came along and said, well, do you mean that somebody who just doesn't work at all is gonna benefit from people who do work? And he said, no, and he had this whole thing with making leisure a primary good and saying people that don't work, are exploiting others to get uh, an unfair share of work and, and came up saying, those who surf all day off Malibu must find a way to support themselves and would not be entitled to public funds, which makes it sound like Rawls is gonna be very conditional. Uh, that implies that Rawls wants something more like guaranteed employment and wage subsidies rather than the uh, Now, Van Parijs looks for things in Rawls. Well, first of all, he sort of rejected that view when he goes to real freedom. Well, he's rejected that view to begin with when he goes to real freedom, maximizing real freedom and maximizing advantage. But also he looks in Rawls's theory, there are reasons to indicate that we might go for UBI. And that's one of the, that's one of the geniuses of Van Parijs, who's very good at finding arguments for UBI using other people's premises. Like when I talked about when he started out with uh, the with reciprocity objection. There's actually also a lot of reciprocity reasons to favor UBI. Uh, so what he says is look at people's lifetime income and opportunity. And uh, if you shift from this outcome, what he calls an outcome egalitarian interpretation of the difference principle to an opportunity egalitarian interpretation, then uh, then UBI is really not necessarily going to have these have these problems and and and, uh, and to be more neutral between those who want to work more and those who seek freedom other ways uh, or use their freedom other ways. Uh, uh, this actually supports UBI. He makes a similar argument against Gerald Warkin, which I'm not going to get into in a major way. Uh, but it's also, he thinks it has a pro-productivist bias. And even Dworkin admits that, that um, Dworkin is very much uh, against UBI because of this reciprocity objection. He himself admits that something like UBI, maybe a, a negative income tax, would work better in practice to make sure nothing else goes wrong, even though he thinks in a first best situation, if you could really tell what everybody deserved, who would give it to him. But uh, uh, Van Parijs, and, and he has the Van Parijs argues that even using his theory, you could get a first best argument for UBI. Um, and he talks about Brian Barry and Andre Gores were originally against UBI and they came out for it. Uh, Marcia Sen really never made a statement on it. Um, he talks about. Um, uh, Freedom is being the power to say no to things you don't want. And the, uh, sorry, the freedom to be say to say no to things you don't want, and the freedom to say yes to things you do want connects that to Pettit's republicanism. I, now let's see. He talks about libertarianism, and there are, of course, libertarians reject what 
we're libertarians reject what liberal egalitarians have tried to do. Liberal egalitarians, whether it's Rawls, Dworkin, Brian Berry, Andre Gors, Van Parijs, are interested in, in being sensitive to your ambitions, but not to anything that's a gift of nature, uh, including things that are internal gifts of nature, such as uh, you have more talent than someone else. They want to equalize these things that are arbitrary advantages. Libertarians, as, as conventionally defined, come in two kinds. There are libertarians who reject who reject equalizing these arbitrary, really basically any arbitrary advantages uh, because they have a strong belief in private property ownership, that that is a natural right that comes before other things and that should be equalized. But then there are left, and, and they have a, a strong belief also that you own yourself. If I own myself, I can't say, you say, okay, um, if, uh, if Benedict owns himself, then uh, the government and, and, and Marvin owns his self, and Benedict is just way more talented. Uh, so Benedict is way more talented uh, than he can earn more than Marvin, and that is just an arbitrary advantage just because of how he was born. Uh, now, a liberal egalitarian said, okay, we're going to tax Benedict to help Marvin. Uh, but, but a strong person believes that, that you own those, you own yourself. I own those natural advantages that I have. Even if they're not, I don't have them because of anything I did, I still own them. And no one can take them away for the benefit of other people. Left libertarians agree with the right libertarians on that self-ownership thing, but not on the, the resource ownership thing. So what's, what left libertarians want to do is we're not going to look at these personal endowments, not trying to make up for that, but um, we do want to equalize external endowments, the things that are caused by socially imposed arbitrary advantage or, uh, or unequal access to the earth's resources. So left, left libertarians accept equalizing natural resource value. And uh, it's possible a substantial UBI could be made out of that. It's not quite sure. There's um, a, a disagreement. There's a lot of empirical disagreement about how much UBI we could get out of, uh, out of natural resource value. I tend to think it's pretty high, but other people think it's pretty low. So, um, uh, and there are some people who are call themselves on the right libertarian side who will also endorse endorse UBI for its market power and access to resource reasons. Um, and uh, so, Mar so, um, so. Real libertarianism is a form of left libertarian in the sense that, that it rejects these pre-institutional -in individual entitlements to the resources of the earth. The resources of the earth are something that none of us have particular claim to, and, and, we, and wh whatever way we're going to dole those out has to be something that, that is in some meaningful way is equal to everyone. Now he also talks about Marx and Marx and Marxian theory in the world today. Um, Marxian theory has pluses and minuses for basic income. Marxian theory is all about the exploitation of the workers to benefit non-workers. On the one hand, that would seem to say, well, if you're gonna have UBI, people are gonna be, there, there, there are people who are allowed not to work and they can have, they can benefit from the people who do work. Um, so so uh, that would seem to exploit those people who do work. But on the plus side, there is a lot on the plus side in Marxian theory. It frees workers from the obligation to work. When Marx talked about people have nothing to sell but their labor, that's what forces them to take these exploited jobs in the first place. And what what uh, what he, uh, Philippe is asking is 
Which is more important, that the, the worker is free from that obligation, that free from that situation where they have nothing to do but sell their labor? Uh, or is it, is it important that uh, when they do labor, none of, none of that is being taxed away or taken away by someone else? Um, it also helps create the abundance that can re re relieve alienation. Marx talks a whole lot about how alienated workers are by no be being nothing but a commodity all day. Why wait for the revolution to fix that? When basic income could do that by giving workers a bunch of other options. Um, so uh, there's a lot of good reasons for Marxists to be in favor of basic income. As a matter of fact, they might be more radical for it than than Van Parijs would, um, because Van Parijs would stop when you maximize the uh, high sustainable level of basic income. They might want a higher taxes to create greater inequality, a lower basic income, but a more equal society with a, a lower end on the top. They might lower the high end just for the sake of reducing the power of the upper class. They might go, in that sense, in one way that's farther than he's going, it's farther than he's going towards taxing the rich, but it's not as far as he's going about, about how much you have left for basic income. Okay, so two hands over here go up immediately. Hey, Marvin, I saw you first. Um, or is that a question? <laughs> um, I think it's um, what you just mentioned is exactly the reason that a lot of leftist people disagree with the universal basic income in that it really doesn't touch on like property property rights. It, it leaves the basic status quo and it's simply a redistribution. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's like the revolutionary aspect. Yeah. So that just has a addition. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm seventy five percent. My my point was seventy five percent of Marvin's point. Yeah. But, uh, I immediately thought like, what what would happen to the means of production? What would Marxist UBI proponents say to um, the ownership of the means of production? Because do we do we let the the capitalist class still have the means of production and just redistribute like whatever wealth arises from productivity? Or do we actually touch on, uh, do we actually redistribute ownership of those means? I mean, that's, they're sort of, they go into that the same direction, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and I think part of the idea is that, you know, the, the capitalist road communism, is which what he uh, called one of his earlier essays on this, is, you know, uh, it, it's now, that's almost 40 years ago, but at this point, it's been like 174 years since the Communist Manifesto and uh, Marx and Engels predicted the, the inevitable fall of the capitalist system to a, a communist revolution. It hasn't happened. It doesn't seem any more inevitable now than it did then. Um, so, so it's a capitalist, you know, why, why, why not do what we can? to help the working class as much as we can and build the sort of utopia that he was talking about with the tools that we have that might eventually mean uh, lessening the power that capitalists have over the means of production. And if you look at what he's doing here, I mean, there's a lot of things that are lessen the power. If you're taxing away resource value, if you're taxing away entrepreneurial rent, uh, and, and, these, uh, and these other arbitrary advantages he's talking about, you are going a long way to weakening the power of the capitalist class over the means of production. Um, okay, Ben. So just for the record, Dreden also has his hand up. Oh, hey, but, and you figured and, out how the electronic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, and also what, what, what I could you know, say to, say to uh, a Marxist opponent of UBI is, yeah. I, I know that in, in Marxist theory, crisis is, is seen as inherent to a capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And so this, this cycle of crisis and then um, yeah. boom, follow, yeah. followed by boom, exactly, I was looking yeah. for the word. And so UBI would inherently help workers during the inevitable phases of crisis. Yeah. So it's definitely better than before. Yeah. So there, there are some like Marxist arguments to be made maybe, or you could get Marxists on board with that, like within their sort of field. Yeah. Can I add something? Okay, yeah, um, yeah, if you, uh, Oh yeah, that, that's 
You see, the people who are present, they can signal me in like more than one way, uh, <laughs> which is, you know, so uh, they can signal me say, okay, I'm responding to what the, the, the last person says, so we'll remain on the same thing. So I'll let her go first, assuming yours is on something a little bit different. And by the way, I'm pretty much done presenting Van Price. Anyway, we can just go, we can go to discussion. The only thing I have remaining to say about him was that he doesn't think utilitarianism has a really good argument uh, uh, either way you know, for or against basic income. So uh, that was the end. Okay, so then. Uh, yeah, so uh, you talked about um, how the fall of the capitalist. Uh, regime has not come yet, uh, as predicted by Marx. I think uh, what um, Benedict said and what you said is that um, there have been revolutions, but there have been revolutions and very um, they have been very mobilized. And it's not that the uh, what Marx predicted is that workers of the world will come together, and nothing as such has happened. So there have been like really small parts mm -hmm. where things have happened, and I think universal basic income would help. Uh, to, you know, uh, I don't know how to say it, to uh, accelerate it in some sense, mm -hmm. uh, to more universalize, uh, empower uh, the labor class against the capitalists. Mm -hmm. So I think then something more, um, more in lines of the theories of Marx would happen. Yeah. All right. Finally, finally over to you, uh, Dr Dritan. Am I getting that right? Dr yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you very much. Okay, I heard you mention previously that we need to have uh, some kind of vision about the point where we want our society to be in the future. And uh, with the artificial intelligence coming in, uh, we could also describe this as uh, some kind of new industrial revolution. And there comes the need for a universal ba basic income because of the displaces of jobs. But, uh, uh, I think we should also discuss UBI from uh, policymakers' ethics. We, we know UBI costs a lot, quite a lot. And my question is, how ethical is to shoot up public debt, which could probably lead to inflation, considering the responsibilities of a policymaker? We have to, uh, we, we got to keep in the back of our minds that those policymakers uh, could uh, be voted by the citizens. Uh, one other thing worth mentioning uh, that uh, I just recalled, uh, Finland, as, as, I, as I recall, tried an experiment with providing a basic income to some people, but it resulted to uh, reduced ambitions and as far as I can remember, a decrease in productivity. So my point is, what kind of vision should we have about our society? Uh, is it is it is this uh, really quite that ethic, ethical from a policymaker's point of view? Um, There's a raised hand, by the way, by Otto. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, well. Uh, okay. Um, I, I guess. Uh, okay. Uh, Otto is is actually another fellow at. Uh, at Freitas. Uh, he was a guest professor here last fall. Uh, Otto, are you wanting to respond to Dritan or uh, is it something else? If you're going to respond to Dritan, uh, I'll let you go. But if not, yeah. I will I will respond. You are. Yeah, that, that was my intention. Um, so I would just like to say about the Finnish experiment that the uh, results of that experiment were very much in line with some of the previous experiments. But in fact, in the, in the Finnish experiment case, the results on employment and ambition were not negative. They were null. That is, they neither increased nor decreased the oh, work effort. Uh, Otto is in fact Finnish. <laughs> uh, now you outed me, um, but um, yeah. So I, I think the the, um, uh, the the results of the Finnish experiment did not show reduced ambition uh, compared to uh, the control group. And um, in fact, it showed slight increases in the, in the work effort of people who received basic income as opposed to people who did not. Um, but these were within the margin of error. So I, I wouldn't uh, draw many conclusions from this. And anyway, I wouldn't draw many conclusions from uh, RCTs Anyway, but that's a whole different topic. Thank you. 
Okay, so what you're asking about there is not, what you're asking about there, Britton, is not so much about Van Parijs' theory, um, but about ethical implications of, and it's even, it's even, it is, you're talking about the ethics of UBI, but you're talking about the ethical implication of these empirical claims about UBI. Um, and I'm going to follow Otto and challenge the, um, not, on the ethic, not on the ethical implication, but on the, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the empirical premises, for the most part, uh, which is, you see, you know, your first part was about the cost of UBI. Well, UBI is probably not as, as expensive as you, as you think it is. I've written two papers uh, well, uh, uh, on the co estimating cost of UBI and several about what is meaningful in the cost of UBI. What is meaningful, I said, is that net redistributive effect. The amount that, that after they pay their taxes and get the UBI, the amount that the net contributors pay and the amount that the net beneficiaries receive, that net redistributive effect of UBI, um, that, is, that is, well, for a, in the United States, a poverty line UBI, that's going to be around 3% of GDP for something more like what I just like to see. It would be more like 8 or 9% of GDP. Uh, for, a, uh, for, say, a $20,000 a year UBI 19, in, at 2015 prices. Um, 10% of GDP is expensive. 3% of GDP is expensive, but it's not undoable. We've raised public spending by, by more than that to fight wars. Uh, so it's, it's very doable. And the question, of course, is the cost of for who? You know, the, uh, what, what I argued about in my book that we talked about today is that that the system we have right now is really costly to the least advantage. And we strongly owe that. We are imposing costs on them, the least advantage. If these things, and if, if these things are gonna make sure everybody's needs are met, if these costs of basic income, and here I'm getting more into the ethics, if, if we're making sure everybody's basic needs are met, but some other things have to come down, some other spending has to come down because we're better meeting basic needs, that must be coming out of other people's consumption of luxuries. If we're consuming all these luxuries and we can make sure everybody's needs are met with 10% of GDP, uh, I think we're, uh, well, my, my, my theory and Van Parijs' theory we're talking about would say, go ahead and do it. Now, um, we went to questions without going to our discussant. So, oh, okay. Uh, okay, I want to get to our discussion. He's going to, going to give another presentation on that break, but but it is only fair to give Dritan a chance to respond. Okay, Dritan, go ahead and respond to you. Thank you very much. Uh, when we're talking about UBI, we're talking about a paradigm shift. So we actually don't really know about the uh, certain effects of, of the of the UBI, and um, it seems that I might have missed the Finnish experiment. But as far as I can remember, I read it a long time ago and, in, and uh, it was installed in my mind that it lacked, it, it, re it, was, uh, it resulted in reduced ambition. But let's, let's uh, talk about more, more, let's talk more practically. If, we, if, we have a, if there's a household with four people and everybody gets a basic income of 1000 euros per month, so why would I have an incentive to wake up tomorrow to work? Uh, if, if, if a certain result show, could, could have showed positive uh, results, positive effects, uh, it, it isn't, meant, it, it isn't uh, evaluated in the quite long term. So it's basically like the COVID-19 vaccine. Yeah, well, uh... I think ben, uh, you should ask that question again to Van Paresh, okay? Um, uh, and, and make sure to you know phrase it ethically because we're going to be talking directly to him. So I won't because uh, I can answer in terms of his theory, uh, but I think he could do that better than I could. In terms of my theory, um, what gives you an incentive to work um, is that's that's not my problem. That's the employer's problem. If I'm an employer and I want somebody to work for me, I got to pay them enough to make it worthwhile. 
I don't say you can't have access to the resources you need to survive unless you follow my orders. I say, okay, you've got the resources you need to survive, but I can give you money that will get you luxuries. And you're going to like having these luxuries in addition to this kind of bare minimum you're living on here in this basic income. If I can't pass that basic test, my job probably sucks and they probably shouldn't be taking it. And maybe that job shouldn't exist. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, said something. He wasn't talking about UBI, but he said he was talking about minimum wage. He said employers that don't pay enough for people to want those jobs and live decently. He said something along those lines. We don't want those jobs in our country. Uh, okay, Julie, you've been waiting a long time to give your discussion. Uh, we went right to the questions because I, somehow when I talk about Marx, that, that hand started shooting up all over the place, which is a good thing. So now, I why. your discussive job on Van Price, and then we'll go to more discussion from everybody else. Go ahead, take it away, Julie. Yeah. So hello. Uh, I think Van Parijs offers a powerful defense of UBI. According to him, it is an important instrument of freedom and it can be economically sustainable as well as politically achievable. Uh, I agree that UBI can free us from the need for survival that forces us into jobs that are dangerous or uh, that are badly paid or stressful or demeaning by any any way but the question that arises is people who believe that work is a moral moral duty over to uh, moral duty ag will ever they agree to a system that doesn't even require a willingness to work And uh, I think that uh, when we get freedom, uh, we tend to take it, uh, I think we tend to uh, misuse it. Because uh, for instance, now uh, taking the COVID situation, my mother is a teacher and uh, uh due to the covid thing last two years have been a drastic change in the education system does uh, there have been many cancellations in the exams so the students who once were willing to study who once were uh, doing who are doing things to achieve grades or achieve success are now not willing or not interested at all in same way will it not be about achieving are things if we get uh, a basic income why would we have or why would be why would we be willing to work if we can sit idle and get a certain amount regularly would anybody like to answer or question this <laughs> okay uh, so so uh, uh, okay, let me get a cue. She really has three questions. Before we get this cue going, uh, uh, she really has three questions, three things, uh, three really important points. Uh, will people agree to a system that doesn't require everyone to work? So it's about the political viability. Of it. When people get freedom, they tend to misuse it. Uh, and when people get money, why will they work? Or will they work at all? Uh, okay, those are, that's what I understood. This. Essentially, in your presentation, those are the three main issues. If I have you right. Yeah, so far, yes. I do have some more points left, but uh, if, we had, we, if, if we can have a conversation over this, we could. Good. Okay, so I have Medha and, uh, and Marvin um, uh, want to respond. Anybody else? Okay, so Medha, you first. Yeah, I, I, I have another question uh, in line <laughs> with what Julie said. Mm -hmm. um, uh, would in a friendly patriarchal society, wouldn't UBI promote uh, sexism of some sort? Because then the man would say, oh, why would you want to work? You can just stay at home and take care of the kids because you are getting a basic income. That I'm talking about in patriarchal society in mm -hmm. developing countries. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> 
fair share of paper and in Germany. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, Marvin. Yeah. Um, I don't really have an answer to how to get people to agree to a universal UBI. I think that's a like really difficult political process. Um, I, I find it a good statement to say that people tend to misuse freedom. Uh, I also don't really understand like what this would be based on. And so maybe before I can answer that, um, you would have to like explain that a little bit more thoroughly, how you get to the conclusion that people would use freedom they gain. And um, I think generally there are still incentives to go to work, even if everybody gets a universal basic income, because I mean, for reasons of like self fulfillment, maybe there are some people who like their jobs and they would still like to do it. They feel like they contribute something, they bring humanity forward. I think that are like motives that are still in play today. Like, um, I think that the term is like intrinsic motivation. And like the UBI would, in theory, just enable people to pursue that kind of jobs. And um, on top, like just because you get the basic income, it doesn't mean that you don't benefit from like going to work because what you work is going to be added to the basic income. You're not going to have less or the same amount just because you go to work. You're still going to be able to afford more, maybe luxuries or whatever, if you go to work. So, yeah. And I might just respond this way to the, <laughs> the sexism argument, where I think if you live in a patriarchal society, you live in a patriarchal society, then the UBI it would be rather empowering women because um, they can like pursue, like, it gives them possibilities to do things they would not be able to do, maybe, because if you have a choice to stay at home or to do something else, because if you... But then the point is, who yeah. makes these choices for you? Are you making these choices? Because in a patriarchal society, your husband or your father makes the choices for you. You know, so what if it, in the deep when you were asking for a job, he says, I, yeah. and he thinks that you need to stay home because you, like, you are all these right now. Yeah. Why should I pay you because you are already getting a basic, like, you can oh. do But I think that's, a, I, I mean, I honestly don't think that will be, like, a huge problem of UBI, even though those differences will arise for sure. But th that would also lead to decreased representation of girls in uh, the human capital of the country. Yeah. Because Okay, now, um, uh, Fabian wants to say something, but before I get to that, I want to address one thing that you said. This is, uh, uh, this is really important because in a, a short discussion of UBI, very often these two contradictory criticisms come up. Uh, we, had, uh, we had both Britain and Jui say, when we get money for free, why would we work? But then we have, then we have Meta saying, well, when you get UBI, why would they keep paying you so much money? Um, they'll just take the UBI out of what you pay. Why do we need to pay you so much money if you got this UBI? Those cannot both be true. If you're leaving your job to uh, live off your UBI, uh, then there's a very good reason you're, you're uh, your employer cannot lower your wages. Um, your lower lower the wages of the people who remain on the job because that's giving them less incentive to work. When people want to work less, the incentive for businesses is to pay more to entice them back into work. So if UBI if UBI is too low to live on, I think that's a possibility. If people or if, if it's high enough to live on, but nobody chooses to live on it then what you're saying could happen. But if that happens, then the thing they're saying is not happening. Uh, not, so that's an empirical question of which of those two things, if either will happen. The way I look at it is that's the responsibility of the employer. The employer has to get people to work for them by offering them good money. But that's, we'll get to my stuff 
Yeah, Fabienne, you want yeah. to say something? I want to I want to reply to the sexist patriarchal um, argument because, like, the points you're both bringing are something that are discussed in like the big A development kind of part of science since the 70s. And interestingly, you're making up the divide between global north and global south, respectively. Because the classic argument, like, eight workers from the global north are bringing assuming that like a ubi or any kind of like aid cash transfer it like would empower women it's like the classical argument like women from the global south can't with like what my husband my father my older brother whoever is like that patriarchal person in charge is controlling and then like if you transfer to ubi or any cash transfer program you're opening the argument like is it paid household wise or is it going to pay individually and like depending on which route you're basically going you're either like going into like empowering argument or you're going into like the controlling side and it's like actually really interesting that like the connection is like often not made between like these eight arguments that are there since like a while and like yeah. basically not going over into the ubi mm -hmm. Andrea? But I think even if it's like pay individual, like for each individual, you will create, I don't know, if I apply for a job and three guys apply for a job, maybe if the man is, you know, matching and stuff, he will decide to go for the guys because he thinks yeah, I'm can, better. But that's like the classical bias argument. This is like yeah. a separate issue from the UBI issue. I mean, it connects on a certain level, but it is not like, the center. Yeah, yeah it's not the center. I also realize it's yeah. not the center, but I don't think it's empowering like women. I think it's very sad whenever people say that it's empowering caregivers or something in general, yeah. but you're not women. Yeah, like the argument is like not that it is, but like that it can be empowering in certain situations. And like if you take like the universality out of it, like if you take a step back from it and you actually mind cultural and social factors, then it can be empowering if you include them in like the distribution or it can construct a really bad situation depending on who's in charge and how it is communicated yeah. and like. Which is a problem in we face. Yeah, with every, in every situation. Like, yeah. Okay. Uh uh, Nan, who's not spoken in some time, wants to talk. Nan, you're next. Yes. yes, thank you, Professor. And uh, I thanks for your uh, opinions. And I, when it comes to uh, the trade off between leisure and the work, uh, it remind it also reminds me about the conceptions of uh, priceless liberty and the worthless liberty. Uh, in with respect to the world's less liberty, uh, the UBI uh, may give us the chance to make use of partly of the uh, of the world's less liberty because if uh, if one is poor but uh, he or she has <coughs> marginal liberty, uh, but he or she cannot use this kind of liberty without UBI. But with 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 the income of UBI, then she can make use of this part of liberty. Yes, thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I want to discuss uh, one important thing. And I, as I said uh, earlier, we're tr we are talking about a paradigm shift. So I think the employment effects that the research show uh, is taken basically on a shorter term. We don't have an experiment or a research that provides an overview about uh, 10, 10 or 20 years. So we don't exactly know the effects of it in the long term. And my my main point here is, could it could could an experiment such like because we mentioned the Finnish experiment, could could it be that people could see it as a certain uh, as kind of make money faster? So they they don't actually have to uh, you know uh, quit work because they know that this experiment will end. So they basically uh, try to make try to pick up more work and then see it as a let's say a get rich uh, get rich faster method. Okay, now we've kind of uh, this discussion has kind of gone all over the place. Um, I think maybe uh, Julie, 
you ask your questions one you, you when you're you, you give your comments uh, like one at a time so, so uh, instead of three at a time so we don't go away that might help I, I like to like talk on one topic we'll talk on another topic okay so uh, so we're all going, we're all responding to different parts of the discussion, which now I'm going to go all the way back to what Medha was saying about good for women or bad for women. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the problem that you mentioned was that it, it might reinforce traditional sex roles because when women can afford to, to raise kids, then they'll be more likely to specialize in that and men won't. Uh, that is a conceivable thing that could happen. Whether it will happen is empirical, but uh, uh, because it also gives men more power to do these things. Uh, and, and we've been moving away from those traditional sexuals, but I wanna look at what it does some things that are really good for women who are suffering now. Um, the poorest people in my country, the United States, are single mothers and their children. UBI, UBI would eliminate poverty for that group of people and a whole bunch of other people, many of whom are women. It gives women, it only gives things to women, does not take away. And it gives them things that the least advantaged women very well need. Um, I would be extremely reluctant to say we're not going to help the most needy women because we have an idea of what our gender role, how it might affect our gender roles in a negative way, uh, that we're not going to do this. I think if we have a problem with, with gender roles, there's got to be some other way to fix that than, than forcing single parents single parents to live in poverty and children to grow up in poverty. There's got to be a better way to promote more equal gender roles than that. Also, I think no. uh, it would, uh, so I think it would help women who are stuck in bad, bad marriages to walk out uh, once you ensure that you get a basic income. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that would be no. an advantage. Okay. All right. Now, Julie. You have more presentation to go. Um, we are getting low on time, so um, uh, if it's if it's if you got if you got a lot of a lot to say, maybe we'll cut it off after what you say, and we'll hold off the rest of the discussion of it until we get back we get back to that for later. If you've got something really short, then we can all react to it. So yeah, I, I I'll, I'll just wrap it up. <laughs> okay. Uh... So uh, I also read the uh, Anderson theory also, where she mentioned three defects of van the real, uh, real liber liberatory, <laughs> okay, whatever. So uh, the first defect uh, that she mentioned, so among the three defects, I don't fully agree to all, neither do I disagree. So the first one goes it, it favors distributing income or direct in-kind provision of or voucher, vouchers for particular goods such as healthcare or education. Wherein, uh, so according to Van Price, people should get money, but according to Anderson, if people get other facilities like education, free healthcare or uh, such, such other facilities it would be more beneficial so i somehow agree to this but then at some point i do dis disagree that uh, the point where i agree is that uh, kids or uh, teenagers instead of uh, instead of giving them uh, a basic income uh, it would be better if they get free education. And in case of old people or disab disabled people, uh, of course, a basic income would anytime benefit them. But free healthcare or uh, such facilities that would help them uh, easier, easy their life, that would be more beneficial than just an income. Then uh, the point where I don't, uh, agree is uh, sometimes uh, 
uh, sometimes what happens like uh, if we consider two fields uh, art and technical some technical field so uh, art arts fields uh, are uh, costly and uh, technical are comparatively not costly so if we get a basic income how would that be an equal uh, thing like how can one person who has higher fees and higher uh, educational cost uh, benefit from the same amount and uh, the person who of course the person who has lesser fee and uh, lesser cost will benefit but what about the other one is my uh, first point the second crit uh, criticism is ubi does not adjust for the fact that due to the variations in internal traits social roles and other circumstances some people are better better able to convert income to freedoms than others wherein anderson says that uh, uh, disabled people and people who take care take care like uh, single mothers or people who have to look after their pet old parents or uh, sometimes people uh, uh, engage in unpaid dependent work so uh, anderson says that how are they going to benefit or uh, because uh, anderson thinks that ubi best serves the interest of healthy adults who care for no one but themselves but i think uh, i do not agree to this point uh, because in country developing countries where uh, um, parents uh, where children have to look after their parents and single mothers or widows who have to look after their children uh, those are the ones that are affected a lot or uh, those are the ones who are poor and in such cases ubi is a is very advantageous uh, they can help ubi can help them support all these things without having the burden to work more and stress themselves more and the uh, last point here goes that ubi promotes freedom without responsibility i agree to anderson at this point because uh, ubi would not only inspire a segment of the able population largely the young healthy uh population uh, to observe work for life of idle fun so willingness to produce and pay taxes would also decrease is what i think and uh, i think uh, i'm done okay great Thank great yeah. okay uh first of all uh uh driton and and julie you were the two who were most critical of van parish so I want you to ask these questions to Van Parash, um, uh, especially that you know, the Elizabeth Anderson one. She connected that. Remember that the name of that essay is "What is the Point of Equality?" Uh, and she was saying that what what this idea of real freedom without responsibility is not getting the basic points of equality. It's, you know, it, it's a relieving people from oppression, not some trivial thing about, oh, maximizing the opportunity to do whatever you might want to do. Um, and so, you know, tie in, so when you ask that to Philippe, tie it in there. He's not afraid of tough questions. All right, to everybody, you know, come in here with tough questions for Philippe and for Guy, neither of them, and we're going to get some others too. None of them are afraid. Otto actually is going to give a presentation. Uh, none of them are afraid of uh, tough questions. So ask those tough questions to him. Normally, I would not end with the discussant giving their presentation. We discuss what the discussant is, you know, asking us to discuss. But we've been at it for two and a half hours. Okay, Benedict, make it quick, Benedict. Yeah. And then we'll go on. Just um, cut it. So, so Dritan was really worried about like the long term effects of mm -hmm. UBI, and I'd be genuinely interested if there's any research on that. I mean, not today, as we yeah. are. So is it, is it like a vaccine where there are no adverse long-term effects because that's not how vaccines work? Or are there actually you know, adverse effects that may, be, uh, that may appear after 10 years, 20 years, when social change has sort of shifted people's attitudes? Just a dropping that I'd be genuinely interested. I asked myself that question after Riton mm -hmm. uh, raised the point, and I'd be I'd be willing to follow up on that. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's something to look for in the literature we have and what's missing. That's more of an empirical question. 
Mm -hmm. um, a lot of Dritton's questions are coming from an empirical standpoint, but he is seeing the ethical implications of them. You know, it's an ethics class. It's not about this. Does basic income have this effect? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to, if you want to talk about empiric stuff, make sure you get a good background, you know, you, you get a good idea that it does have this effect, you know, and then, then what are the implications of it? Because we don't want to spend a lot of time arguing about does it have this effect or not? That's not ethics, that's empirics. Um, so can I, can I just like yeah. follow it? just a second like we had a presentation on like empirics of experiments like mm -hmm. in October I have like the book manuscript for that so like if anybody is interested in it like my email address is on the Freebus homepage you can just mail me I like forward you the manuscript sounds great yeah okay um okay so let's end it here for today